about uh, need and uh, motivation for this need for better specification and verification of standard mathematical functions. But I would like to use uh, these five minutes not to give you details, just to tell you a story. Just to tell you a story, if you are interested in details, just come to my uh, poster and ask me. Even poster is not complete, of course. First of all, I would like to convince you that pi is exactly 4. Really, once upon a time, I came to my class <laughs> to teach uh, first year students, freshmen, <laughs> Uh, loops in C. And it turned out that instructor who had class before me taught the same topic, loops in C. And he selected to teach this topic uh, Monte Carlo algorithm to compute pi approximation. But by the way, sorry, sometimes I, will say, uh, sometimes I say P, sometimes pi, because I am Russian. <laughs> uh, not because I am Greek. <coughs> but nevertheless, the idea to, to use this uh, algorithm was very, very natural. F to teach loops, it's very good. It is not good to compute a pi approximation, but good to teach loops, because we have two loops. Instructor simply explained the idea how to compute pi, simply drop random points into a square and count how many are inside uh, this segment. And then just divide, divide one number by another. That's all. If you have a uh, million trials and repeat this experiment 10 times, you should get very good approximation. Well, but imagine he's confused. This is a screenshot from my uh, netbook uh, with exercise of this program. Program is not mine. That all 25 students in his class, he did not give code. He just explained algorithm and just uh, su suggest to students how many trials should they exercise, N nothing more. But imagine his surprise that all 25 students, that is 25 independent computer experiments, got 10 times exactly four. Well, we should try computer simulation. So when I came, I just said, well, independent programming, independent computer experiment, so pi should be four. We just should prove it. Why not? Let's start. Let's present human-oriented, human manual pen and paper. Oh no, chalk and blackboard proof. The, it was chalk and blackboard. So, what is the uh, length of the circle? Of course, pi d. What is the uh, perimeter of this square? I believe 4 d. Do you believe? Well, trust me. Then let us cut corners. <coughs> right. Use, uh, roughly speaking, let us use L1 matrix. Uh, well, definitely, perimeter still is 4D. Do you trust? Do you see it? But evidently, obviously, visible that this, well, this figures, if you proceed further, converge to the circle still having per perimeter equals to 4D. So, well, due to visibility, obvi obviousness, uh, of course, pi should be equal to 4. If you would like my verse on this topic, I will give you later, not right now. Um, so, <coughs> what was confusing for me after this story, that fortunately it happened, it, it is a real story, it happened just two days before Pi Day. So I had something to present on Pi Day. Uh, but unfortunately for me, nobody asked me what is wrong with your proof. <laughs> and unfortunately also, just one student uh, tried to guess what was wrong with the program. In particular, in inst on instructor computer, everything was good. Pi was really very good, got very good approximations. Very good approximations. Well, <coughs> but this time I decided to be very, very, let me say, um, boring person. Instead of answering this student what is wrong, I just suggest, okay, I can stop anytime because it is just to attract people for my poster. No. Okay, <laughs> I just suggest student, let's try to apply formal methods. 
for in particular, let us try to specify this code uh, by pre and post condition by, by basically uh, by uh, to specify total correctness since 25 experiments said us that pi is 4 and since this program doesn't use any any input it should precondition should be true right since we use floating point point arithmetic it makes sense to write something like this and try to prove it but if you try to prove it you will find that there exists one assignment for which you don't know formal semantics unfortunately unfortunately if to go to document see documentation you will not find formal semantics all uh, either unfortunately of course it is just a citation from the standard but it says too few about formal semantics for rent unfortunately it is enough basically it is enough to change precondition and prove that it, okay come on for my poetry <laughs> questions <laughs> Uh, sorry. Now it is your turn. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. Um, hi, uh, my name is Nicholas. I work at the User Center Social Media Research Training Group at the University of Duisburg Essen. Today I'm going to talk about privacy and how a technique, a uh, formal technique like inductive logic programming, can serve privacy awareness. Um, so this was me at the beginning of my PhD when they told me, okay, we want you to work the area of privacy and we want you to work the area of privacy in social media. And why I felt so skeptical because um, social media is a space where we make our private life public. <laughs> so for many, many years, the privacy, privacy researchers have tried to keep private information away from public disclosure. And these spaces are designed for disclosing personal information. So here I have a motivating scenario for you. Uh, someone writes a negative comment about his or her workplace. And uh, of course, when this comment reads uh, family, friends, nothing happens. When it reads your work colleagues, bad thing can happen. For example, a wake up call from your superior, bad image and job loss. It sounds like a very Mickey Mouse uh, example, but this actually had happened in real life and with even worse consequences. So my point is that users are not always aware of the content they disclose to targeted audience and their potential privacy risks because it's a very unnatural space to communicate. When I'm communicating offline, I know, for example, how many people are in this room, who is getting my, my message. But when I go online, I mean, the audience are very large and diverse and it's impossible to control and apply some, <laughs> and apply some self censorship. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, what can we do? So we can, uh, we can define this as a problem of privacy awareness. Um, uh, some research has been done in this area. Uh, these are uh, it's called privacy nudges uh, from researchers from Carnegie Mellon. They try to apply um, uh, sentiment analysis to a Facebook post be before it's posted. And they were given the chance to the user to rethink if he or she wanted to disclose this information. So this information basically raised awareness on the content being disclosed and helped people to avoid these unwanted incidents. Um, uh, what do you think that people react that about it? it? Like, I hate privacy nudges. Exactly. <laughs> That's my point. So many people liked it and many people hated it. 
And why is that? Because in order to generate engagement between people and these technologies, you have to fo follow three, the three design principles. First, they should be adaptive. So they should take people's attitudes and intentions into account. Uh, the second one, uh, they should bridge the emotional gap between the users and the private digital data. What I mean with this, um, for example, if someone stops me in the street and asks me for my passport, I'm not that willing to give that information away because it's, uh, I can feel it, I can touch it, but uh, when a computer, a screen asks me for this type of information, I give it more easily away. So there's a detachment, an emotional detachment between people and, and, and their private data when this data has a digital support. And the third principle is that they should recommend best practices to overcome these potential privacy issues. So what it, what it's, what is, is it helpful that this thing tells me that this is a negative message? What should I do? Should I close my Facebook account? Should I buy a new computer? What should I do? So they should recommend a, an eventual course of action to overcome this difficulty. So um, uh, a privacy heuristic or a bet best practice that we can uh, easily make it's, um, is constrain our audience under a certain criterion. And um, which criterion can that be? For example, taking the privacy risks uh, um, of a potential regrettable scenario can be a good criterion for audience restriction. For example, if I know by hand that if I disclose this information to my work colleague, something bad can happen, maybe I take them away from the audience and then I can continue in a more safe and private way. Um, so basically, uh, one can define these regrettable scenarios uh, as a triple of private attributes, the audience, and the risk associated with disclosing these attributes to this uh, to a specific audience. And let's assume that private uh, attributes and the risks we can uh, we can take take them from somewhere. The problem is that the audience. Uh, which is a collection of recipients of the information, it's variable. So if when I say work colleagues, what am I saying? When I say family, what am I saying? Who, which users should be inside that cluster? So how can we find these heuristics and how can we automatically learn the audience of a particular, for a particular user? It's uh, other research questions that I have here today for you. So one hypothesis is that what people delete uh, from, the, from their Facebook um, in the case that it contains private information can be a sign of regret. And the other assumption is that um, so we can use uh, uh, an approach like inductive logic programming for learning the audience uh, using trusted, untrusted recipients as an example. So uh, ILP, it's uh, basically a technique that allows to infer a hypothesis from a set of examples and some background knowledge. Um, uh, they are uh, expressed as horn clauses and uh, this background knowledge consists about some pre-existing clusters, for example, risk, etc. everything that we can use to build a clause that satisfies those examples. Uh, so these are like uh, two examples on how can uh, this information be expressed. And uh, there are several uh, ILP um, engines like Progol and that use more declarations to, uh, as, a, um, as a search space a constraint for the, for, the, for, the, for the right clauses. That's it. Um, well, actually, uh, I'll put my hands and my, my cards on the table. My background is mostly on human-computer interaction and artificial intelligence. And uh, when I was in my master's, I did quite a lot of prologue. And it came so, so um, naturally for me to write constraints like that, like that in prologue. And I said, how can I infer a prologue rule, a predicate that, can actually, with that, that I can train with examples? And that came just because of that process. Yeah. I have another approach uh, working with uh, um, decision trees that could be more transparent in the procedure. And so if you want to do some compliance regarding some, some requirement, it's easier to, to track. But if you're more interested, I wait in the poster. I like the microphone. <laughs> Don't take it with you to the bathroom. No. <laughs> <laughs> Did it happen to you? <laughs> Classical movie mesh. Something like that happened.
Okay. So, uh, hello everyone. My name is uh, Alexander. I am from Annapolis University, and uh, my talk is called "Expressing and Verifying Reactive Requirements Seamlessly," which was uh, done uh, with uh, some colleagues. Uh, short uh, biography. I'm not going to to stay here for a long time. Um, so uh, the research uh, the research uh, questions uh, I'm trying to answer within my uh, PhD research are how much can we reuse one and the same set of notations or one uh, notation for uh, several activities simultaneously, uh, in particular for software requirements, uh, implementing the requirements and verifying the implementation against the requirements <coughs> with some uh, sub-questions. And so uh, the context of the, of the talk is uh, reactive software. And by reactive software, uh, we mean uh, the software of this uh, coarse grain structure. Uh, it's an infinite loop uh, with some routine uh, repeatedly executed. Um, and this uh, routine pulls uh, some sensors uh, of, of the physical system and possibly sends some signals uh, to the actuators if applicable. And the specific example is a landing gear system uh, that is equipped with a uh, latch that uh, closes uh, and opens, letting uh, the gear extend or retract. <coughs> And so uh, the task is to specify and implement um, a controller for this system. So uh, this example is a widely used benchmark for uh, um, verification techniques. Uh, some assumptions. So we assume that uh, the main routine is uh, repeatedly executed, uh, looks like an abstract state machine, impl but implemented in the programming language. Uh, this, we may assume this is possible because uh, um, abstract state machines uh, consist of three operations, each of, uh, and these operations map directly to, to some uh, operations in uh, any general purpose programming language. And the, uh, the second assumption is that we have a horologic based uh, program prover at our uh, disposal. And in this example, it is uh, auto-proof. Uh, it's a prover for Eiffel programs. <coughs> uh, an example, uh, it's from, from the study that explains uh, the uh, uh, landing gear system. Uh, the requirement, an, uh, an example of a requirement is this. When the system is working in normal mode, if the landing gear command line has been pushed down and stays down, uh, that is to say if the handle in the cockpit uh, uh, was pushed by a pilot uh, down and stays down, then the gears will be extended and the doors will be seen closed eventually. So uh, the selection has different color because so the, the selection in blue is uh, uh, denotes assumptions and the selection in red denotes what, what is required under these assumptions. And so uh, here we have a temporal logic, uh, linear temporal, temporal logic representation of this uh, requirement. This is supposed to be a diamond, you may <laughs> not. So uh, Microsoft Office is not very well at uh, uh, temp temporal logic uh, symbols. <laughs> so uh, m maybe I'm not that good at uh, searching uh, proper symbols. And so what, what, what brings some suspicion in this requirement is uh, do we, do we really want it eventually in the general form? Because, uh, well, uh, we, we, we don't want it uh, to, to be uh, at arbitrary distance from, from pushing the handle when uh, the plane uh, uh, is being used. And so uh, we decided to modify the original requirement <coughs> in this way. So uh, um, whatever was required uh, is should hold in not more than three transitions of the main uh, uh, routine. And uh, we used uh, timed propositional temporal logic to rewrite the original requirement. <coughs> you, you can see it uh, uh, 
below. Um, and so how do we express uh, these assumptions and requirements? Oh, okay. Uh, in as a program in, uh, in the programming language. So we use the standard uh, assume uh, statement used for verification. We introduce a new routine run in normal mode where in the beginning we assume um, this expression was taken from the original case study and we have a call of this uh, main routine and then the next assumption reflects uh, the assumption that uh, the next routine reflects the assumption that the handle is pushed down and uh, uh, this uh, calls the previous assumption, calls in the progr uh, programmatic sense. And then uh, the requirement is expressed uh, in this way. So basically it's a uh, uh, hard triple without precondition. It, it, it runs uh, the previously specified uh, routine uh, in a loop and uh, it, 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 is it is limited with uh, three iterations and, uh, and so we use the program prover to, to discharge uh, this uh, proof obligation and so uh, yeah we have some uh, results namely uh, uh, we found an error in a, uh, in a case study uh, and uh, so here are some re important references used uh, uh, in, in our work. It's not, it's not all references, but uh, <laughs> of course. But, uh, Uh, instead of uh, what? Instead of uh, the clock. Yeah, use uh, here? Yeah. Uh, but, well, next uh, means next the next state. Here uh, we may be in a... No, you wrote three conditions. Yeah. Once you wrote three conditions and not three times, you need... So uh, originally, the, tempor uh, the timed uh, propositional temporal logic means something else. Uh, I use this uh, abstraction to uh, ideally I should have uh, introduced uh, an additional uh, variable to denote time and uh, re and uh, use it for reasoning. Uh, and this is actually done uh, in the in the in the article, uh, but um, <coughs> so uh, because. Uh, I, that I was given a small amount of time. I decided to simplify uh, things uh, a little bit. But yes. You must specify that the normal mode happened at t and the two uh, Where? Where? I mean, these are technicalities. <laughs> yeah, so uh, for <laughs> yeah, so so the, the most interesting part uh, is supposed to be on this slide, but uh, I was in a rush uh, <laughs> reaching <laughs> both. <laughs>
computer, the laptop uh, fell down before? Mm -hmm. the, the laptop fell down before? The laptop uh, fell down. Uh, where is the last uh, laptop that was used here? <laughs> can we use yours? You can take the one you bought. Now do it Don't, don't, don't just, <laughs> just don't touch it. <laughs> I just have a video. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um. Man, something is happening. Okay, I probably copy it to the desktop. Okay, so uh, good evening everyone again and my name is Anastasia, I am from TU Munich and today I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that we've done together with Eva Darulova from Max Planck um, Institute for Software Systems. <coughs> and uh, we, a couple of speakers ago we had a nice example of the floating point confusion and um, why is this happening? Because algorithms for numerical programs are usually designed by humans and humans are continuous beings. So we are thinking in real numbers, not in finite precision. But when it comes to implementation, we have to deal with this finite precision thing because we don't have infinite amount of bits to represent our number. And this approximation inevitably introduces round of error. Well, in lots of cases, we would say it's okay to have an error, but what we want to know is how big is actually the difference between what we initially wanted to compute and what we are computing in fact after we've implemented our algorithm in finite precision. And, uh, well, we can simply take a difference between the value that was computed in the real value function and the floating point implementation of it. But is it good enough? So, for example, if I tell you that we have an error like that, we cannot really say how big is the impact of this error until we know which of these function values we actually have. Because in this case, the error is huge. But for such a value, the same error is rather insignificant. So, uh, this example illustrates that uh, absolute errors do not always provide us a good enough estimate of uh, accuracy. And what we want to have instead, uh, to have a relative error, which uh, this measure combines the absolute error and the value of the function. And uh, we are simply, again, taking the difference uh, between the real value and the floating point version of it, divided by the real valued function and maximize it over the predefined input domain. So, idea uh, is pretty straightforward, and why did no one do that? Well, actually, that's not quite true. State-of-the-art tools do compute relative errors, but what they do is they first compute absolute error, then they compute the function value, and simply take the difference. But we can see that it's not exactly how we defined relative error to be. 
And moreover, since we are computing separately nominator and the denominator, we are losing all correlations between variables uh, in nominator and denominator. And therefore, the approximation, uh, the, the over approximation uh, becomes coarser and coarser. And what we want to have? We want to have sound and tight bounds. And uh, therefore, we decided that we will follow the definition of relative error. And uh, we have to keep in mind several challenges. First of all, even for linear real-valued function fx, we will have as a result non-linear uh, expression, which uh, means that uh, the over-approximation that we will com commit during evaluation of this expression will get bigger. So we need some smart technique in order to make our uh, bounds tight. And also, um, this expression is much more simple than this, especially the, the bigger uh, the real value function gets, the more operators do we have, the, the more it grows. So we also want to deal with this issue. And one more thing, since we are um, doing the division, we should not forget that whenever our real valued function actually reaches the point where it turns to zero, we're getting then division by zero, and well, this is infinity, uh, it's not useful for us at all. So what we do uh, is we apply the Taylor approximation to this expression under maximization, and that uh, helps us to simplify it well, actually good enough. And our smart technique uh, to reduce our approximation would be a combination of interval arithmetic and the SMT solver queries. I can tell you a bit more detailed how we do that, but uh, maybe not during the six minutes. Yeah. And so we also had the practical solution for the division by zero um, problem. What we did is for this inter uh, input intervals, for each uh, variable, we just subdivided it into some uh, equal-sized pieces. And uh, then we computed relative error only there, where we did not get this division by zero. And for the rest, we only computed absolute error. And all this beautiful algorithm <laughs> we implemented in the tool called DAISY. So DAISY takes as an input real-valued specification of our program and the set of inputs uh, input ranges and outputs floating point implementation of our program and the relative error bound. And actually, this tool is open source and is available on GitHub. I don't have a poster, so if you have any questions, come talk to me. Yes, I, so can. I know that uh, Intel put enormous effort to uh, provide library of scientific functions. And there is a person there, John Harrison, who has been working using Theorem Prover now for probably 20 years, building robust implementation of, uh, of, uh, of, of real value function, of course, using item in closing points. So I'm just curious uh, how does this tool perform? compared to a person who's been now been spending 20 years on doing this? Well, actually, I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, we do not, like, uh, what is the name of the tool that... Uh, no, it's, it's, it's Intel provide the library of scientific functions. Okay? Yes. These are so tricky to do, and you have to know very much about how the floating point operations are really implemented in the Intel processor. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they have a, a mathematician who has been working as a full-time for many years. That, on, okay. Uh, on, on doing this. I agree. That would be interesting thing to check. I, I wonder why we did not. <laughs> uh, we also, like, performed the abstraction of this floating point function, and we are uh, exactly using the IEEE standard for that. So, uh, we are uh, after we perform this abstraction, we are kind of dealing with the real valued function completely. So, okay. I don't know. No, no, it is not a question. It's just a comment. I, I tell it later to, uh, to myself. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. um, so, you mentioned that uh, currently the way people uh, compute that is the value is by taking the maximum amount of the uh, numerator and denominator sectors. Yes. Uh, have you done any, any analysis on how much is the difference? 
Yes. Actually, yes, I just didn't have time to present that, but uh, there were uh, several benchmarks where the difference was about seven orders of magnitude, like computed using this state-of-the-art approach and directly how we do that. Yes. You said you were wondering why nobody did it like this before, like you did it before. And is there a reason for that, that the current state-of-the-art tools are not like using this for me, simpler, Well, it's not exactly simpler because of the, uh, well, you need to, um, to reduce this over approximation that you commit during the process when you obtain this bound from the expression. And uh, this is like, if, if you just follow the naive approach, uh, then your, like your, you, the bounds that you c will compute will be too big, like too much over approximated. So you need to like want to do this. And I think uh, the focus was just uh, initially on the absolute errors. So also maybe that's because of this division by zero issue that, well, it, there is like no real solution for that. Um, there are the practical methods to like exclude this, this point where it turns into zero, but uh, well, in fact, like if you have the zero, then you just. So we want to look at the limit. At this point, you want to look at the limit of the L. Well, yes, probably. Is your fault zero? Yeah. Uh, now I have a question. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so uh, I missed maybe. What is I in your case? Uh, you also choose maximization, not the supremum or something like this. Uh, is it finite set? Well, yes, this is just uh, the input ranges for my input variables. But nevertheless, uh, they are real range. Uh, real range. Yes. In, so the, the you should use supremum in this case. I'm sorry, what? You should, should I? use supremum, not maximum. Why? I just want to have to find the maximum relative error on this uh, in for this input domain. Okay, so I didn't plan to talk here, so I didn't prepare any slides, so I will do it on the blackboard. So my name is Laureline, and I'm just starting a PhD in Lyon with Damien Pousse and Denis Kuperberg. So what I will present you is really ongoing work. Uh, so we are interesti interested in uh, Lucky Automata. And uh, as Javier told you, uh, it is really interesting, an interesting object uh, in the um, scope in of formal verification. And one of interesting problem we have, we have is um, the language inclusion problem.
Um, the language equivalent one. Which is strongly related to the first one. So, those are our problems. Because they are the space complete. Um, so, what I, what I am working on is dealing with the language equivalent problem. Uh, and so, it has linked with the language inclusion the other one. So, we have two bulky automata. <coughs> and we want to know if they accept the same language. And what we do is that we transform this problem into a problem on NFAs. So the automata are not equivalent, but the problem is equivalent. Then we determine it. So we have the FAs. And when we have DFAs, we can use B simulation because it is cheap. <laughs> but the problem is that when we do those transformation, we have an exponential blow, blow up. And so the goal is to say that the, the DFAs we obtain are not any DFAs because we obtain, uh, we obtain them by a specific construction. And we want to use <coughs> the fact that they have a peculiar structure to speed up the B simulation and not have to explore the whole DFAs we, who, who have exponentially many states. So in the case of NFAs, we use B simulation up to congruence. So that's a work which has been done by bon Bonki and Puss in 2014. And the idea is that we, we have even more structure when we come from Bucky Automata. And so we want to, to design up to techniques that will allow us to cut part of the DFAs we obtain and not to have to explore them uh, entirely. So, um, so that's the plan. And what we have still to do is then to compare uh, what we obtain when we do this with existing methods. So uh, in theory, but for this, we need to have a common framework. And also in practice, because as they are p-space complete problem, we know that we won't have a good worst case complexity. And so we have to do some experiments to know if it works well in practice or not. OK. Do we have questions? They are very uh, mature tool for uh, bulky containment. Like Rabbit is a very, very yes. good tool. Yes, this is yeah. the one we hope to compare with. You have to compare with. Uh, yes, but they do mostly containment. And the hope is that we will uh, produce something that will be at least as efficient for containment and more efficient for equivalence. Equivalent. Yes. Um, when we do it, there is one here and one here, so there is a double one. But we can we can do some refinement to have a single one from here to here. But uh, when we do it naively, we have one here and one here. Yes. No. 
No, it's not a, um, and it's not a transformation of Buki automata to NFAs. It's a transformation of the equivalence problem on Buki, and it's from uh, Calbrix, the one I use. Yes. This one? Uh, yes, the idea is to use uh, uh, ultimately periodic words. So to say that uh, they are equivalent, uh, equivalent if they are ultimately periodic words are the same, and then to represent them as finite words. Uh, 